you, you, I, I can't just come into my um, my garage and sit down and, and, and punch out a bestseller. It's it's peaks and troughs. Um, so it's it's about recognizing when 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 uh, when it's right and, and then getting after it and being really disciplined about it while it's while it's happening because it might be fleeting. You know, it's a it's a solitary endeavor. Painting and writing are done, you know, uh, between ten and two in the morning. Um, and when it when it when it grabs you, you have to just do it, you know, and then get up and go to work and, and do all the other things that you have to do to get through your day, and then do it again and keep going until it until it's gone. And it might last for a month. It might last for a day, you know. Hey, Shorty, how are you today, mate? Great to be back on the few podcasts with you. Yeah, great, mate. Really looking forward to today's uh, today's guest. Should be a little bit of uh, interesting, a bit of fun, probably a bit, of, a bit of sarcasm from you guys, given that you know each other. Oh, mate, I don't know whether this podcast is going to be able to, to uh, get in under an hour. I'll tell you what, mate, I am super excited uh, for today's podcast because I get to catch up with a, a very old mate of mine and someone I met who helped me establish my very first business nearly 16 years ago. Can you believe it? Uh, with no further ado, uh, we are going to be speaking to artist, author, rough hand, oil working, hardcore mofo, Paulie Carter. G'day, Paulie. How are you, mate? Hey, Paul. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, so, so good to, uh, to see you, Paulie, and, and how apt it is that we're podcasting you while you're in your man shed there. Yeah, I'm in my I'm in my man cave, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Paulie. Here on the few, mate, we're all about people that are living their life's purpose. People that have the uh, the opportunity to do exactly what they want to do at this point in time, and wake up in the morning feeling like, hey, I'm having a good day. This is exactly what I want to do. Now, interestingly, uh, Paulie, your life has taken a few uh, tangents uh, along the way. Uh, some funny connections you and I have is the the squadron that I flew over in the UK. Uh, your dad. Uh, was also uh, a navigator in the same squadron uh, a few years prior to me, uh, which is which is a small world. And, and Sean was asking me earlier, how do we how do we know each other and how do we stay in touch? Because really, you and I met uh, back when you were working in marketing, and you helped create the very first logo for the Christian Thomas Group, which is now a global behemoth when it comes to uh, humanitarian project support. Uh, but that's not your real life, was it, mate? Tell us a little bit about Paulie's journey prior to designing a corporate logos. Oh God, that's like a that's like a bad Roman Polanski film with more <laughs> blood and violence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so uh, yes, so Chris, um, that's how Chris and I met because I was working um, in oil and gas at the shitty end of the stick of oil and gas on the drill floor. Back in the good old days before there was safety or the internet or drug testing. Um, so it was all about um, how fast you could uh, drill the hole, you know, so corners were cut and, and guys, you know, cut shit off their bodies and permanently damaged their thoracic spines. <laughs> so I was, I was working hard crew changing all over the world. Um, 18, 18 different countries on three different continents. It was just nonstop. Um, and on my time off in those days, it was, um, it was an equal time rotation. So it was a month and a month, but, uh, the crew I was on, we all got so tight. We all worked together for 20 years. We'd often do extended hitches. So we'd stay till the well was drilled. So sometimes I'd be gone for three months and on my time off because I was addicted to it. Um, I'd get back home to Sydney and I was a bachelor then. And after about two weeks, I was itching to get back offshore again. So I had to kind of train myself to slow down. And then I ended up working um, on my time off and I got a gig with uh, a marketing company uh, writing, you know, taglines for, for, for advertising campaigns. And, you know, more often than not, it was just about taking the piss. Um, so Chris's, Chris's which is pretty request. much fundamentally what marketing is all about. Yeah. <laughs> and Chris's request was the first one I took really seriously. Um, and that's how we met. And of course I liked him instantly. Uh, and we stayed in touch over the years. So Paulie, let's, let's revisit that oil, oil and gas stuff. I mean, I remember when I was a kid uh, and uh, I was, I was keen to be in the air, air force. There were just, there were a few 
professions I always thought I would be terrified of being involved in. One was the bikey gang and the other one would be working on an oil rig. So how does, <laughs> how does a teenager, how does a, how does a, how does a kid uh, end up getting involved in, in the oil and gas industry and working in, in what was at the time probably one of the one or two most dangerous environments on the planet? Uh, right. So you, it, uh, the, the, it, it's an industry that you have to be born into. Um, it's very hard to get into. Burst on the um, deck of an oil rig. Yeah. My, my, my mother, my parents, uh, I think you mentioned before, my father was a, an Air Force uh, aviator. So my parents split when I was seven. And, and um, mom went off uh, into Aberdeen and we lived in this really poxy council flat and she's doing it tough. She's knocking her pan out as a motel receptionist, uh, trying to raise, raise uh, two children. And um, the, the forties field was booming at the time. It's the late seventies. It's 77 in, in the North sea uh, and very quickly turned into the biggest oil and gas hub on the planet. Um, and suddenly Aberdeen went from this sort of sleepy uh, Northeastern seaboard fishing town to the to the center of, of oil and gas exploration so lots of people from overseas came in lots of technology came in and mum ended up getting hired by an american gentleman who was staying at the at the skiing do hotel uh, near the airport and my mother's german and the company at the time was setting up an office in cellar in germany and uh, he was she might have checked him in and out three or four times his name was jack jackson he's an awesome guy and um, he said, I need, I need someone in the office to, to, who can speak German and English, uh, written and spoken. Are you interested in a job? And of course, my mother said straight away, how, well, how much does it pay? And uh, he, he offered her a good paycheck. So she jumped into um, oil and gas that way. And that was me. That was, I was skipping school uh, because he was amazing. He was very, very uh, good to me. Um, mum worked feel really like a, hard. Did you feel a father figure type for you, mate? Or you, were you able to still hang, in, hang out with your dad? What, what, what was the sort of dynamic there? Your dad was living in, in granton on spey in the Scottish Highlands. Um, and I would regularly visit with, with, with dad. Uh, but it was the day-to-day the -day stuff. I, I would skip school and go and hang out where the offshore guys would crew change. And there were all these larger-than-life lads, you know, big scary dudes, full sleeve tats. Uh, and they would, yeah, rough house me around. They were cool, and, right? Oh, they were, they were amazing, man. They gave me buck knives. They gave me playing cards with naked ladies on them. <laughs> um, they gave me my first beer, you know, and it was just fun. I, I wanted to be around them more and more. I wanted to be one of them. Um, and, and that's how it started. So I, I was around the age of seven when I, I got my first sort of look at oil and gas. And, and that was it. I was addicted to it and, and couldn't wait to, to catch a break and, and go offshore, be one of those guys. It's amazing, Paulie, you, you're, the common theme in, in everything we do is people that connect with that purpose or that, you, you didn't connect with working on an oil rig, you connected with a family, you connected with an environment, you connected with a, a peer group that you felt compelled to, to be a part of. And just to quickly fast forward, that industry is still giving to you now, many, many years later, is it? and that it, it's given you many more opportunities beyond what it what it was more than just working on an oil rig, uh, the ability to uh, endure, to be resilient, to understand that you can sort of push yourself and do random shit, but still kind of survive and, and, and have a good time. When you first started in, in the oil rigs, did you, did you think that was it? That was it for life? That was, uh, was, was it something that you felt was going to be a portion of your life? How did you sort of feel when you, when you left school and got your first job? What was it like getting that first job? The first day you, you, you hopped on a rig? Well, I was, I was doing badly at school. Um, we moved to Perth, uh, Western Australia, when I was 15. And um, coming from Scotland, you know, you had to drag my ass off the beach. You're not going to go swimming in the North Sea or see a woman in a bikini. And that was me. I was, I was full tilt water baby. I was, loved it. Um, and was getting very distracted and failing badly at school. I, I'm also a product of um, 1970s um, British education. So I'm, I'm wildly dyslexic and was pegged instantly as being, um, you know, thick and, and I was going to get held back. Um, 
So arriving in, arriving in Australia, um, I went off. I mean, everybody had a pool. You know, people had two cars. The, the fruit was huge. It, you know, everything was brilliant. And so I was way too distracted to be uh, academic. Um, and I, I started to muck about like teenage boys do, got in a bit of trouble. And, um, you know, so my, my mother spoke to uh, Jack and um, Jack spoke to uh, Irwin. And uh, it was going to be a case of, well, the, the boy's going to have to go off and join the military to straighten his ass out. That was my father's advice, of course, or put him on a rig. It'll make him or break him um, because you fit in. You have to fit into the crew um, and, and knuckle down and, and learn, learn the system. And a lot of the guys in, in, that, in that period in oil and gas, especially the HE work, the hostile environment stuff, because the drilling goes on regardless. It doesn't matter if there's a natural disaster, a coup, jihad, war, insurrection, doesn't matter. Uh, the, the drilling will go on regardless. So, so those guys have a system and, and if you have to fit into it. Um, so it was done as an experiment to straighten me out. But the minute I, I was very lucky, I fell into a crew that were prepared to help me and, and slow down my brain so I could get, get rid of all the white noise and actually learn something. And instantly I found a brotherhood. Um, and I stayed with them for 20 years. So I was, I was lucky. It was a combination of, of parents' intervention and, and synchronicity. Um, but I, I instantly knew that that was me. That's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. It's a very common theme in all the conversations we have, Paul, is that, that the, the importance of having the right people around you and you know, whether those people lift you up or drag you down. Because, and that can change at different phases of life as well. You could be going through you know, younger years and things like that and, and having a bit of fun and everything. But then when you start to think a little bit differently or, or aspire for different things, that 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 uh, those that uh, those people that uh, are part of your inner circle uh, are actually starting to become, are starting to slow you down or hold you back from, from your potential. So, I mean, by the sounds of it, you would say that the people around you are incredibly important for, for your own development and, and your opportunity to create success. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, I was incredible. I won the lottery uh, because, the, uh, you know, oil and, oil and gas crews more often than not tend to be, um, you know, they can be pretty wild. And, and I was just very, very lucky I got into a crew and they were a combination of man, ex-cons, ex-military. Uh, and they, 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 I was lucky to get accepted into their group. They're all much older than me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I fell in with some guys who, who uh, Erwin particularly, you know, he, um, he was my benchmark. You know, father figure slash maybe older brother all rolled into one. So I took all my cues from how he operated. Um, yeah, and, and, and made me Erwin's laugh. still close today, Paulie, right? That's, a, that's, that's a, a connection that transcended work. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, we'll always be tight. You know, he lives in, he's retired now. He, hell, he's 60. He's 65 next month. God, we got old really quickly. Uh, it happens, doesn't it? Come, comes, <laughs> it sneaks up on you. Now, 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 interestingly, Paulie, you being uh, in the oil and gas industry, uh, there's clearly one or two stories uh, that come about by operating in those hostile environments and with colorful characters. And at some point, you decided to write a story about that, yeah? Tell us a little bit about your first book. Oh, wow. Okay, so I had, I, I had no aspirations of being a writer. You know, I didn't finish high school, and I'm dyslexic, so that was never anything that would ever have occurred to me. However, um, we were bidding for some work in Russia right after 9-11. And the knee-jerk reaction globally in oil and gas in the drilling sector after 9-11, everything changed, of course, we all know this. But the oil and gas sector kind of suddenly looked at their offshore assets and went, that's kind of like a bomb with no detonator. We need to start policing the people a little bit more thoroughly. And the Russians took that very seriously because all of the technology to do these extended reach drilling operations in deep water was coming from somewhere else, including the crew. Um, so there was a long protracted vetting process uh, for the overseas operators who were working in that sector, and it was uh, the Sea of Okorsk, northeastern seaboard of Russia above Japan, 
uh, which is really isolated and really dodgy. It's a gateway for nefarious things in and out of that part of the world. And there's nothing up there. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of missile silos in a prison, you know. Um, the biggest threat to us in, in, the, in the nearest town of uh, Yusno was uh, always move around in a group uh, because of the bear attacks <laughs> and, and the angry locals. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and some, and some guys messed up and got pissed and wandered off. And there, one dude got his foot cut off, cut off with a fire axe in a nightclub because he looked at some gangster's girlfriend the wrong way. So it was a bit hairy. And, and uh, it was the vetting process for the Suckland Five campaign, which was run by BP. And I was in Vung Tau, uh, Vietnam, on a, on a jack-up working. And my back-to-back -back didn't turn up. He had an appendicitis. So I ended up uh, on the drill floor. Uh, and uh, for 72 hours. <laughs> I mean, again, you know, health, safety and, and all the rest of it. And back then it was just, no, 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 just keep, give him drugs so he can keep working. Um, so I got, I got on the Hilo, I, I got into uh, Vung Tau, I caught a commercial airliner back to Changi, Singapore and just cooked. I mean, you fiddle with your sanity after 48 hours and I was fucked. And I'm, I get off the plane because you only ever fly with a little grip bag. There's no check-in luggage. And my boss is waiting for me uh, with Erwin at the, at the arrivals in Changi, Singapore. And he says, oh, mate, I'm really sorry, but it was booked months ago. You've got to go and have your Sacklin 5 psych evaluation. And I just looked at what? So they drove me to this to, to Changi Med Medical Center where there was a psychiatrist and a psychologist who were going to proceed to sit down and pull my brain apart. And I was just in a bad place. And, and it was, he was an Australian guy. He looked like a hippie crossed with a King Charles Spaniel. <laughs> and, he, and he said, okay, Paul, you know, are you comfortable? And I'm just staring at him. He said, let's talk about your relationship with your father. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I, I told him what I thought of him. I, I told him what I thought of me being in that situation in the first place and how fucking ridiculous it was. And I stormed out of his office. Uh, I went back to the hotel and, and the phone rang immediately. And my boss Drew's on the phone saying, what do you think? You do? We are not going to blow this tender. We're, we're in the lead position to win this work. We need this work. Your crew needs this work. You will go back there at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning and you will fix this. Um, he's calm now, but he wants an, a letter of apology. And Jesus. I, so I sat down. I went to sleep and I woke up and I drank the mini bar. And I, I got the hotel stationery out and I wrote this, what turned into a dyslexic 5,000 word rant on, on, on that situation. And it just how ridiculous that situation is. I went back to his office at 9 a.m. I sat quietly in the, in the waiting room and he, I heard this laughing. I heard these two guys just piercing themselves laughing and they came out and they hugged me. <laughs> and, they, and they said, that's the single funniest document I have ever read. Uh, I did the... I had my evaluation, I passed. I went to Russia. A year and a half later, I managed to get my hands on my, on my jacket, on my, on my evaluation. <laughs> and I got the rest of the crew's evaluations too. Ambu's had NAFOD written on it um, because he's from the jungle in Borneo. Born and raised in the jungle, he just doesn't have anything on his value system that comes close to you and I. He's, he's out there. The guy's amazing. And I found out that, which is ridiculous, NAFOD means no apparent fear of death, <laughs> <laughs> which is silly. But, but if you knew the guy, that would kind of make sense. Mine had um, constant plausible death by misadventure <laughs> uh, written in the notes because we do stupid things when we weren't offshore, racing bikes and just doing dumb shit. Um, yeah, so I got my jacket off this guy and I sent it to a mate in Sydney who knows me really well, just for shits and giggles, along with my letter of apology. And, and he thought it was funny. He showed it to his wife. His wife went ahead and sent it to Sue Hines, uh, the trade publishing director at Alan and, Un Alan and Unwin. Uh, so I get back from a three-month hitch to it, several um, messages on the answering machine. Hi, Paul, you don't know me, but uh, can we have lunch? And so I go to lunch and, and, and she offers me uh, the opportunity to write a book. And uh, I said, really? And she, yeah. How did and, that and feel, so I, Like, how, how does, have, having, you know, being dyslexic and probably having a love-hate relationship with words, how, how does that feel with someone? You can tell a story, but how, how, how do you feel about writing a book? Well, that's exactly, I, I, I kind of vocalized that to her and said, um, 
uh, yeah, I didn't finish high school and, I, and I'm not really great with, with words. <laughs> and she said, yes, but you can tell a story. So just write it down verbatim like you would tell a story, like you were talking to the guys in the bar or on the drill floor. Okay, so I, I went off to Russia and started writing down, don't tell mum. And the editing process was fast. They didn't change that much. They just corrected my shitty grammar and bad sentence construction and, and, and getting my, my letters mixed up. And that was it. And they, they printed, um, it came out, they printed 500 copies. And uh, I was so scared that it wouldn't sell. And I didn't want my colleagues to know because they give me a hard time. So I put the advance check that the publisher gives you in, in the bank and didn't touch it because if you don't sell any books, you have to give the money back <laughs> and went back off to Russia. And the next thing I know, I did another three months, I came back and, and they'd since printed another 5,000. And then the next hitch, it was 50,000. And, and it, I sold a lot of books. I was incredibly lucky. So it happened by accident. Yeah, I mean, that, that became a best-selling book, didn't it, Paulie? Yeah. Yes. It, and, and so I wrote another one. They said, write another one. You have to write another one. Oh, okay. So let, let's, visit, let's visit that. Sean, I mean, you, you know, here's, here's that classic story, right, of, uh, of, of, of a good idea, uh, unexpected, not being comfortable, the fear of failure, all of these things that we're constantly seeing, right? Well, they, and that courage and that boldness to actually just go, hey, there's an opportunity here. Do you want that? And I had that with my first ever speaking gig where someone said, do you want to come and you know speak at this business event? And that was the one of my biggest. That was probably my biggest fear it was public speaking. And I just went, yeah, sure. And then crapped myself. But then I rehearsed my rehearsed it in verbatim, ninety minute. Well, first of all, it was forty five minutes. It was supposed to be in the middle of a three day event. Then I got bumped to the last slot on a Sunday, the last part of the event, and they asked me to go from forty five minutes to ninety because someone had to pull out. I'm like I just said yes, and I'm like, oh shit, and I re I rehearsed it in full for 90 minutes, 19 times beforehand, because I'd said yes. And I sucked a bit, but I told a story and the people resonated the story, not my performance. Then I realized that it was the story that carries the weight. I just needed to learn how to communicate better on stage and engage, create engagement. But that's the same thing. It's that boldness of just saying yes and then just giving it a go, isn't it? And how do you do it? Like Paulie, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Like you've, you're probably not really afraid of going into a bar in a third world country with a smoking monkey and people throwing knives at the wall, but the fear of the fear of, of writing a book and being so exposed and open and copying the banter from your mates. And that's a bigger fear, isn't it? That, that fear of putting yourself out there rather than the fear of physical harm. Well, yeah. If you, if you, if you write your story down and it's personal and, and, and you're honest about it, uh, yeah, it's, it's a pants down moment. It's tackle right, out so in front of the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you, 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 you're bollock naked in front of the world to, yeah, to, it's, to flail you, you know. Absolute vulnerability. You just, you're being, yeah, yeah. And particularly when you're taking your whole story that, and now they can see, now people can see a big chunk of it versus just the little bits you allow people to see. Yeah. Now, Paul, you're, you're, a, you're a humble guy, mate. You've had a lot of success, but you would never say it. You would never, you would never, um, see that you spruiking your own wares or, or getting in, involved in self-promotion. In fact, the opposite. So you've written a book now. It's very, very successful. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was so, I thought it was so awesome when it, I think I bought, or well, you sent me one of the first copies and I thought it was hilarious. Uh, ab absolutely loved it. Uh, and then, yeah, so you decide to write another book and again, we've got an opportunity to do some stuff together. Oh, mate. Yeah. The, well, the, 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 uh, my, my publisher uh, said, um, can we, can we go again? Yeah. So, so we, Cause it, I, it's I needed... still selling, isn't it? I mean, don't tell oh, mum yeah, is still yeah. a, my, my, <laughs> my partner's mum loves it. When she found out that we're on a podcast today, before, before I even met, uh, met them, she's like, oh my gosh, Paul Carter, you're having a podcast with Paul Carter. I can't believe it. I love that. <laughs> I love these books. <laughs> and you and people would think it's books written for blue collar men to read, but it's they're not. They're they're, they're telling these stories of, of humanity uh, in when it's when it's tested. Sorry, sorry, mate. Yeah, but your second your second book. How did you feel about writing a second book? Pumped, totally pumped because I was able to. Um, I had a little bit more carte blanche uh, with my publisher, 
to, to go into areas that they, they, they push me back on with don't tell mum. For example, you can't say that about Americans if you want to sell books to Americans. Um, you can't say that about oil and gas if, if, if you want it to keep employing you. <laughs> um, so there was, a, there was a little bit of holding back, which I pushed in the, in the second book. And what I was particularly fascinated in, in what was happening in Central Asia at the time, which you were heavily involved in. And um, they're, they're, they're therein presented the opportunity to, to ask Chris um, very nicely if I could um, spend some time in Afghanistan and, and maybe have a look at, uh, at what was going on at the time. Anaconda hadn't finished that, uh, that it, uh, uh, you know, not, uh, it had just ended. Everything had just ended. And um, that was utterly fascinating. I couldn't just turn up uh, in, in that part of the world. I would be instantly capitulated. Um, no one would talk to me. But if I asked Chris nicely and he let me just be the gray man, stand in the corner and watch, it was fascinating. And, and that was, was a real eye. times, wasn't it, Paulie? This was, this was the, the start of the proliferation of, of private security and companies oh, doing yeah. the bidding of nations, not, not just in, in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East, all over the place, Nigeria, you name it. And, and oil and gas was, as you said, you, you drill no matter what. And therefore, at oil and gas, you find yourself at the front line of all that BS, don't you? You, you do. And thank God there are, there are entities that uh, you can engage to, to cover your ass. It's stressful enough being on the drill floor. It's an inherently dangerous place to be on a sunny day. Um, add add uh, Mother Nature into that equation and, and the opportunity of getting hurt um, because you got kidnapped trying to get to or from work or they have a go at the asset itself. Um, if, if, if we weren't able to engage um, people to, to make sure that we can go to, go to work and feel safe, um, that has a roll-on effect with everything, everything. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking over your shoulder all the time, you're going to end up cutting your hand off or, you know, cutting your hand off because you were worried because you didn't sleep after a 12-hour hitch. Uh, so I, I found that fascinating and I wanted to know more, but it was a very closed-off world. It's a group within the group. You know, you can't just barrel in and, and hi, fellas, you know. Uh, but I saw an opportunity there when, when, when Chris branched out with his business. And I thought, this is my chance to, to, to have a look and meet some of those guys. And, and it was brilliant. I'm so glad that it happened. Yeah, it was interesting times and uh, around, around that time period. And uh, a bit like oil and gas, the private security industry is um, full of, full of color, colorful characters. Uh, mercenaries, m missionaries, or misfits, uh, being the the key phrase to encompass all of those uh, individuals. Uh, so, when it came to to writing the book, though, Paulie, uh, and I remember when we were in Afghanistan, you were writing, and you 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 got incredibly sick uh, oh. in in possibly one of the most uh, inhumane, least medically supported environments on the planet at the time, uh, being uh, Kabul around two thousand. So I can't remember six, seven or eight, somewhere in that six. too much life's happened in between there. 2006. Um, now with, with writing, with writing the second book and balancing, you know, working and income uh, around now, you were getting married, I think was, or you just got married with Claire. Uh, I, I've been married you, a you week. Balance everything. I got married a week earlier and then, you know, we hadn't had our honeymoon yet. I said, right, I'm going with boo. I'm going, I'm going to uh, Kabul. Bye, darling. And then we got on that. God, we, 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 got, in, we got into uh, uh, the UAE. We, we were, no, Dubai. Oh, Christ, I can't remember. But we got on a Pakistani International Airways flight to Kabul. And you go from this nice part of the airport where people, you know, they're going on holiday. It's just a regular <laughs> yeah. the, and then the you secret, get to this, The secret terminal in Dubai. <laughs> you get to this other, other terminal and, and everybody... I mean, this funk, you sort of, it's palpable. And, and yeah, I, I, woo, this yeah, isn't a regular The misery fight. is resonant inside that terminal, mate. Oh, it was hectic. And so we're stood there in, the, in this Pakistani Airways, uh, Pakistan International Airways ticket. I'm holding it in my hand and we're queuing up to board the aircraft. And I look, <laughs> I look down at the ticket and it said PIA Airlines. And their tagline was, we're better than you think we are. <laughs> that instills the same airline, a very high level of confidence. Two months, 
in the last Sorry. two months has just been exposed for having over 300 fraudulent parts <laughs> never actually did any theory and did dodgy exams. So uh, 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 taking your life in your own hands, Paulie, <laughs> jumping, on that, jumping on that flight. Bloody hell. And then we got, and we got there, of course, and I hadn't, I hadn't been in country more than, oh, I was less than a week and I got dysentery. Uh, oh, God, it was just hectic. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, a great experience. Another story, Thank another chapter in the book. And another it's so important to, uh, yeah, Tom, my business partner, best mate at the time, uh, and, and you, we would talk to you. It's like every time something happened like that, we always used to say, well, look, there's another chapter in our book. Uh, and, uh, and it's so important, I think, to live a life where you create stories. And every time something goes wrong, uh, mate, there's no stories in any, any of your books about stuff going right or things going normal, or, or business as usual, a normal day in the office. Every single books. story in your book is about something outside the norm. And that's what makes life rich, don't you think, Paulie? Absolutely. It's, it's adapt or just die. And what, what are you going to do? You're going to... I just, I just can't be that guy, you know, mow the lawn on Sundays and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and sit in a cubicle and uh, wait for entropy and eventual death. If, you're not, if, if, if someone's not getting prodded with a big stick... Um, you're wasting time. It's, that's the most valuable commodity I've got. I'm 51. It's time. So I, I, can't, I can't waste it. So it's about family and, and, uh, and just not wasting time uh, and trying to be creative all the time, which is, which is tough sometimes because we all go through, um, you know, ups and downs of... of you, I, I can't just come into my, um, my garage and sit down and, and, and punch out a bestseller it's it's peaks and troughs um so it's it's about recognizing when 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 uh when it's right and and then getting after it and being really disciplined about it while it's while it's happening because it might be fleeting you know it's a it's a solitary endeavor painting and writing are done you know uh between 10 and 2 in the morning um and when it when it when it grabs you you have to just do it you know and then get up and go to work and, and do all the other things that you have to do to get through your day and then do it again and keep going until it, until it's gone. And it might last for a month. It might last for a day. You know, it's like these artists that, uh, that, uh, I go and see, uh, who exhibit regularly, um, you know, and they're lucky because they can go into their studio and blow their nose and it's amazing, you know, <laughs> and, and I'll spend a month try, trying to punch out a piece of art that I'm, that I'm happy with. And, and more often than not, I'm, I'm not satisfied and I paint over it and start again. Yeah. So you talk, you talk to to obviously the discipline to do it, and particularly when the moment strikes to actually get in and do it. And I find that as well. I'll either, I'll either be up until two in the morning, or I'll wake up at three thirty with this idea, and I just get up and have to go and capture it. <clears throat> but there's one of the things we talk about that's a thematic again within these conversations that we have with the few uh, is that around how important do you feel consistency is in making progress over time extremely important um i well i i, I need a routine i have we've all got routines i've got a, i've got a regime i stick to if i deviate away from it i'll get distracted um and i'll end up on a side thing and then you end up with five things happening at the same time and they're all shit at the end yeah so i need to prioritize and and do that one thing and do it really well uh, until I'm absolutely done the best I can do. And that includes all the shitty little jobs. Cause if you do, if I'm doing two things, that's my task saturation point. If I'm working on a writing project and a painting at the same time, I can't go beyond that because I'll muck it up. So if it gets hectic or I'm, I'm stalling, then I'll immediately start, you know, cleaning the gutters or mowing the lawn or doing something with Sid, you know, and, that's and so true, isn't it, mate? It's that, it's like one thing, well, two things, overwhelmed, brain trips yeah. off, procrastinate, you flick yeah. the yeah. procrastination switch. And, uh, you know, and it's almost like your brain needs time to figure out which of these two things is the most important thing to do right now. Uh, and if you, if you are doing too much, and I think this hap happened, Sean, with many small business owners, is there's always too much to do. You do nothing. Uh, yeah. And Paulie, you, I guess what, what's fascinating with, with your endeavors, mate, is you're creative and, and and one of the things that, uh, and I think it's a misconception people have about creative people, is you're all over the place. You've got to be creative, and therefore I don't need structure. 
if I have to, if I have too much structure, I'm not creative. And I think that's a load of bullshit. So do I. Yeah, so do I. It, it's it's uh, there has to be there has to be there has to be structure. It's like it's like my mother. You you, you know she would always say, as soon as you get out of bed, son, make your bed. You make your bed in the morning. Get up and, and organize your room uh, and keep it clean. And then do all that stuff and pack your own lunch. And and, and so I'm I'm banging onto my kids to make to make them do that. And I, and I think it's really important um, to do that. Do the basics, you know? do the basics well. And, you, and, and Sean, we didn't even have to ping uh, Paulie on it. He came straight out with the SLJ. Yep, the <laughs> shitty, little, the shitty jobs. little jobs. Uh, but that's like you say, with, with most business owners, because they've got so much going on and it's all the SLJs, but a lot of the time the SLJs that actually don't lead anywhere. They've got no substance to them. They're all noise and it's just, just, rubbish and and as you say that that thing about having a a structure a routine or a way to keep you focused and particularly in this day and age with with these bloody things that you know the phones and all that sort of stuff that we've got that are binging us and making us say phone says jump you jump you know like i haven't had my um notifications or sounds on my phone for the last five years i don't have i don't it doesn't bing it doesn't ring it doesn't do anything because i don't want it to tell me what i'm going to do because i'm very easily distracted as well. I think and we all I, are. I think, I think that's one of the challenges with the few and, and the, and, and I know Paulie, your brain never turns off. Like it's never off. Sean, your brain is same. never yeah. off. And if you, if you unbridle that thoroughbred, mate, it's, it's kind of <laughs> shit all through the laundry. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Unbridle that thoroughbred. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're all cooked. And, and Paulie, it's, there was a period in your life, mate, where you were, you were, because you, you, it really puts you on the stage in the oil and gas industry, writing these books and, and offers and opportunities were presenting itself left, right, and center. And there was a, there was a time period there where you were, you were an author, you were, you were, you were involved in a, in a land speed record with a diesel motorbike. You had multiple oil and gas businesses. You were uh, painting, uh, being a dad, being a husband. Was there a time there that you just went, oh, hang on, this, this is just starting to get a little bit too much. No. And no, how did because... you how did you deal with it? How did you deal with 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 all of those different priorities? That's a really good question. And the, and I w- this was oh gosh, the, when that was all happening was about a decade ago. So yeah, that's absolutely right. There was there was, it all, always it's always the way it it happens at once. So so um, book three had just come out. Um, National National Geographic asked me to host a television series. Um, on the history of Australia, which I, of course I said yes to. Um, and, and, and all of the other things were happening at the same time. And I was able to juggle it all and do it and, w- and work my ass off because my wife is awesome. If, if Claire wasn't backing me up, I would have stuffed all of that stuff up. So I had a support system in, in a wife that um, be unbelievable, you know. Uh, and and if, if Claire wasn't... Um, if Claire wasn't there supporting me and propping me up, there's no way, Chris, I would have, I would have gotten through that, that, that period, you know, of juggling all that stuff and trying to do it really well. Um, yeah. yeah she, it's like that. You, isn't it, mate? Like family and you're, you're a guy that, ha- that forms deep bonds and connections with people and keeps them for a long time. Um, yeah. So I yeah. Think that stability, that family stability and consistency for you, that you value that, don't you? Yeah, that figures most largely in my value system. Well, because I come from a broken home. Um, I, I come from a, a, a very unhappy childhood. So, so um, and we're not close because we're dysfunctional. I, 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 we, we don't, none, no one in my family communicates as often as they should. Um, so I wanted to have, uh, I, I crave that stability and, and, and loving, uh, nurturing environment. And, in, I was just incredibly lucky in, in finding uh, Claire, um, which is the catalyst for all of that. Um, feeling comfortable up, feeling comfortable enough to let those things happen and keep and keep saying yes and do the thing and do it well, um, only because I had the support and the and the confidence to do so. Someone's got your back. Yeah, someone's got my wife's got my back, and uh, you know Claire says it's like that thing. You know, when Cortez reached the new world, 
uh, he burnt his armada into the bay and his um, colleagues said, what are you doing? And he said, yeah, there's no plan B. We're going to make it work. Claire's a bit like that. You know, she's it's very true. much shit or get off. Kid, and my dad used to say to me, or oh, maybe you should go to uni just in case. I'm like, well, I'm all in, butter pilot, all in. <laughs> I don't know. I, nothing else floats my boat. And we, I can't remember who it was, uh, Sean, but I think we had someone say this uh, a few weeks ago when we we're talking that same deal, no plan B. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I know. I remember that. And it's likewise, same thing, school. Everyone's like, oh, you know, what university you go to? I'm like, I'm not going to university. I'll be continuing to grow and run my business. And people are like, you're some weirdo. Like, you're not going to university? Your life's over. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, can I tell you a story? Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, kind of, it's very much relative to, to um, you know, the, the mess that the, the, the world is currently in and, 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 I'm 51. I'd, I'd been engaged uh, uh, with a Swiss uh, multinational oil and gas entity for the last seven years. Um, I'm good at my job, um, but was made redundant on the 29th of May. So exactly three months ago today. And I've never lost a job in, in my life and, or been made redundant. And, and so it, it, I could see it coming and it happened. I was expecting it. And then when it, uh, when it did happen, I went, oh. So I came home and I sat down in the garage and I poured uh, a four-fingered Macallan and, and just felt sort of middle-aged and redundant. And, and, you know, well, this is a bit shit and, and, and moped around the house for 10 days and then went through the panic stage of, like, wow, I don't have a job. There's no money. Um, shit and and so i went on to and i'm i'm totally inept with social media and always have been so i jumped on linkedin and uh i clicked on the thing you know that i'm i'm open to uh work oil and gas bearing in mind oil and gas uh right before the pandemic had hit its worst downturn since the end of world war ii i mean entirely just horrendous scenario of events um to cripple the drilling industry globally like cripple it so i thought it made my career's over like it's over um so i went on linkedin i did the thing i, I wrote my cv i kept it really brief it's two pages and um within an hour it ding ding and there's a there's a job it was a drilling logistics coordinators role for for an offshore drilling contractor a job i could do standing on my head and i thought oh oh Okay, so apply and, and attach, you know, my, my CV. And it's being mitigated by a large recruitment company, a big global entity. And they, they rang me within 20 minutes and said, hello, Paul, please come in for an interview. When are you free? Well, uh, tomorrow, morning at tomorrow morning at night. Great. So I shave. I whack on a suit. I go to their office in the city, you know, and I get out of the lift. And I, as soon as I stepped out of the lift, I realized that I'm just one of 200 guys. 200 guys and it's the first wave of 50 and, it, and it's this it's this, this we've all been punched out of some factory of of sad middle-aged broken men <laughs> sitting in the waiting room reading a two-year-old copy of oil and gas journal just looking beaten and i got out of the lift and i went off oh. and i walked up to the receptionist and she goes i can fill out fill out the excuse me the clipboard with the tick boxes and a bic pen so i go and stand in the corner and start filling this bloody form out one of the boxes is um we randomly film, the machine randomly films interviews for training purposes. You won't be on camera, but your voice will be recorded. Do you give consent to use your voice in the other there for training purposes? And, blah, blah, blah. and I ticked yes to everything. And then I waited for an hour, staring at a two-year-old copy of Woman's Day and get called into this smaller office. Um, you know, it's that partition-y stuff. It's like cardboard. And I sat down and there's this young man, mid-20s, early 20s, uh, who's going to interview me. And he's fiddling with my cv and he looked at me and he said yeah we kind of want tertiary qualifications for this role and, and i said oh well it didn't say that on the linkedin thing and he's like yeah but you know yeah we, we, we really look we're after someone with you know and i'm also a little bit concerned about your communication skills so a small a small yeah, like tactical inability to communicate yeah <laughs> it's, it's just like a small tactical thermonuclear device went off in my brain and i had a fucking meltdown i had a really bad meltdown i had lost my shit with this kid 
And, and I looked at him and I went, Simon, let me just stop you there. Are, are you looking at that document and you're only seeing a 51 year old dyslexic man who didn't finish high school? Is that all you see? And he's like, well, you know, um, I said, mate, you know what? Is your dad in? <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I said, is, is your dad in? I want to talk to your dad. What do you mean? I said, I want to talk to a grown up, Simon. And he said, I, I, I think you need to leave. And I said, no, I think, I think I need to talk to a man who hasn't got pen all over his hands. And I lost it. I fucking lost it. And he goes for the phone and I bang my hand down on top of his hand on the phone. I said, Simon, are you calling security? And I said, am I scaring you? And he went, no. I said, do you want me to? <laughs> and it's getting bad. He stands up. I stand up. And I said, look, it's okay, man. I'll leave of my own volition. But know this. Two thirds of the men you're going to talk to over the next couple of days have hemorrhoids that are older than you. So you need to adjust your attitude, son. And I slammed the door really hard and art fell off the wall. And this one random guy jumps up and he high fives me. He goes, good on you, Paul. And he high fives me. I get to the lift and I'm pressing the button and shit and the doors open up and there's a 300 pound Maori guy with no neck and full sleeve tats with security written on his shirt. And I, he looked at me, I said, oh hi, and he, I th he said, I think I'm here for you. I said, yeah, come on, we got in the lift and we stood there in the lift and I'm looking up at him and it's ba 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 And he said, Did you get the job, Brute? And I went, what do you reckon? He said, don't worry, cuz, you'll get a job. <laughs> so I went home, I poured another four-fingered Macallan and, and just, just felt really naff and bad because I went off at this kid and it was shit and Claire came home and laughed. And 10 days go by and then my phone rings and I pick it up and it's, hello, Paul, you know, I'm Roger Pumpernickel III, the uh, Southeast Asia Pacific Director of Blah Blah Recruiting. I'm calling to apologize <laughs> because we randomly filmed your interview and it's gone viral in our company. <laughs> Uh, and I'm in Perth at the moment, and I, and I would, uh, can I re-interview you personally and take you out to lunch? And I said, yeah, but only if Simon can come to <laughs> <laughs> So he goes and he's sitting at the table. And um, since that's happened, it's been, what's it been, about a month, and they've sent me four jobs. And I keep, I've I keep turning them down because I'm happier now just painting than I've ever been in my life. Um, Dang, there you go. No, that, that's awesome, mate. But do you think you needed that, Paulie? You needed to go through that process to connect with what you really, really want to do. Because you are the yeah. master of the side hustle, mate. I mean, let's, let's face it, best-selling author, side hustle, painting. Because your, your, your first exhibition was in the Wentworth Gallery in Martin Place. Like it was, yes. It was, not, it was not a small gallery and a small uh, exhibition. It was prime real estate here uh, in the middle of the CBD. Yeah, I'm very, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm incredibly lucky. Uh, and paint painting is, um, I just find it, you know what? I wouldn't have started painting. Chris, you know this, if it wasn't for you, man, you're being very humble about it. Chris, um, he knew I always fiddled with art and, and painting and he was in Perth on business and he started, Chris started just, he, I think he picked up on, um, uh, that I wanted to paint, but it was making excuses. No, I, mean, and, I just and, remember that mural. But when I first met you, you I was on social or something. You painted a, a mural at the oh uh, yeah, the yeah foyer of the marketing company, and I needed a mural for the foyer of the hotel we just built. And I was like, I know, I know the mural guy. Yeah, and he, and, but he was pushing. Was Chris was pushing, uh, and because I, and because Chris is awesome, uh, I paid attention when he started prodding me with a big stick. He was like a. It was, he, was like a he was like a retired greyhound with a stuffed rabbit, right? <laughs> he, he didn't let it go. It, I'd pick up the phone, do the painting. And there'd be a text message. Hey, Paulie, do the painting. And, and, and so finally I said, oh, okay, fine, I'll, I'll do it. And bang, straight away, the minute I went and reluctantly started, uh, a doorway opened up and I just didn't stop. That was three years ago and I haven't stopped. Uh, so I, I have Chris to thank for, you know, pushing me. And I'm and I mean, have you seen that so come up a, in? It's a, it was my pleasure, mate. It's a, a great, a, a great deal. Paul, well, have you seen? Sorry, have you seen that come up um, in other times where you know those people around you that seem to know you better than you know yourself have given you a bit of a kick up the ass when you needed it to actually get you to take that leap or believe enough in yourself to take that leap? That I'm assuming you would have seen that at more than just that time. Oh God, dozens of times. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because it's your it's your close mates. You know, the, the, pe the people who actually give a shit about what you're doing and, and, and you know, making sure that you're OK. And, you know, you check in all the time. Um, and yeah, 90 percent. It's it's uh, it, it, it wouldn't happen at all of my own volition. Oh, that's that's great. And then the, the thing too, just just jumping back a step, there's a thing that stuck with me from that, obviously that story of not necessarily showing up as the best version of yourself, because what was what I've you know what I've observed, and I've seen this thing happen to me and others as well, is sometimes we need to really be slapped in the face of what we don't want, to actually make us realise what we actually do want. And it sounds like that really gave you a good solid slap in the face a couple of times, and then you're like, hang on, I don't like the feeling of this. There's got to be something different. And it actually got you to maybe the same coin, but instead of seeing the asshole, you started to see the, the head, the pretty face, right? So it's, it's, but sometimes you've got to go through that journey to realize, okay, this is not what I want to then allow you to see what it is you do want. And, and again, I'm assuming it's probably not the only time that's happened. And everything has a formula too, right? Like you're, when you're caught up with something else, you're not fully engaged in what you want to do and you miss the, you know, Polly, we've been talking about doing podcasts and speaking and, and opening yeah. new avenues that, that because you have the time, because you're not doing something that you don't really want to do, you can grind out what you do want to do. And all of a sudden, what you want to do starts to become a viable economic mm -hmm. proposition. And Paul, we haven't even touched on huh? you know, some of the other things here. You, you've, you've got a movie that's bouncing around, but no doubt COVID smashed that. But for, for a while now, the, the rights to the book have been uh, thrown around LA. Uh, you've met some pretty heavy hitting producers uh, yes. to, to tell the story to a, to a broader audience. Where does resilience hit, kick in there, mate? And, and uh, I, I guess people often say, oh, you're lucky. Oh, Paul, you're lucky that you, this happened or you're lucky. But how, how important is the persistence and the resilience piece to have the luck arrive finally? It's the most important part because uh, you know, luck will play its part. Um, but if you don't, the minute you stop pushing yourself, um, it goes away very quickly. Um, so the, the, the process of uh, film adaption, yeah, that's a steep learning curve. I was arrogant enough to get on that flight to LA um, uh, and assume that, ah, how hard is a screenplay? You know, <laughs> it's dialogue, it's movie, yeah, it's easy. I watched loads of telly. <laughs> that is a that is a that is a level of alchemy and a skill set uh wow i very quickly checked my ego and uh shut the hell up and and uh it's a it's such a skill getting uh, a narrative into uh, a feature film structure from a disjointed book like don't tell mum which is really a series of vignettes of men behaving badly H how do you take an, a, a protagonist in that situation and, and actually make it appealing for a wider audience in the film spectrum uh so that they can make money and bums on seats and all that stuff um yeah so i'm very impressed with uh with the uh, writer director that was vetted to uh, ad adapt that book into a screenplay. Um, brilliant guy. His name is Gil Junger, um, and and I knew instantly that that he was the. They'd found the right man because he he was making me laugh. You know, within ten minutes of of meeting him, uh, he he just he gets it. He gets he gets all of it, um, and he, he was just making me laugh. He's got a brilliant sense of humor. His comic timing is is outstanding, and I knew straight away he was the right the right chap to, um, to, to do it. And I learned a lot from Gil um, with the writing process. Not that I was involved in the screenwriting. I was just there to you know, fill in the blanks and answer questions and so on. But brilliant experience. Oh. So it's in its um, fifth draft now. COVID's uh, obviously shut down a, a lot of production opportunities for, for everyone in the film space at the minute. But I'm- Dead pull, you know, mate. Did, I think Ryan Reynolds held onto that script for like 10, 15 years before it finally got written and, and, uh, and launched and became a, a, a huge success. Uh, Paulie, coming into, unfortunately, mate, we eventually have to stop talking. Uh, uh, but one of the things you mentioned, and it's a common thread throughout your life, is the people around you. Well, what do you reckon were the, were the three best pieces of advice that you've received over your lifetime? And if you had the advice earlier on, what would you would have done? Well, um, the day I got married, 
my, like I said earlier, my family, um, no one, no one was at my wedding from my family deliberately. Um, but I remember my, um, my mother rang me, my German mum. she rang me, God love her, um, a couple of hours before the ceremony. And she imparted three of her best pieces of advice uh, for a successful marriage. And bearing in mind, she was married to my father and worked in oil and gas, you know, her whole life. <laughs> I took it very seriously. And she said, I can't do German accents, but my mother said, darling, women need three things to be happy in life. And I'm hanging on the phone outside. You know, she said they need security, sex, and shoes, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> then my dad rang. And he, he, he said, he said, son, marry, marry for love and nothing else. But if she's rich, don't forget your dear old dad. <laughs> <laughs> so three pieces of advice. It's a tough question, Chris. I think, I think it, I, I, I learned a lot from Erwin and, and Erwin, he used to do this thing with me where if we were doing a thing, if we were debussing off a chopper, for example, and it was a deep water thing, and they, th they turned that thing into a flying gas can to get out that far, and you hit your PNR, your point of no return. So the guy's committed to putting the bird down on the big H, and it's pivoting on all axes, and it's really rough seas. And I'm not the best at, at debussing off choppers. And Erwin would just grin at me. And I'm, my balloon knots, I mean, I could crush a diamond. I'm so scared. I always have been. And he'd look at me and he'd go, hey, what's your blood type again? And I'd say, oh, fuck, be positive. And he'd go, that's right, Paulie. <laughs> <laughs> be positive. And he was always just be positive. And it was always a joke around my blood type. Um, yeah, I guess if I could go and tell my younger self something, a good piece of advice, it would just be, um, yeah, don't sweat the small stuff, you know? Yeah. Don't get wound just, up just on the thinking positively. It's just, uh, just that, that click in that moment, which is okay. Yeah. Maybe there is another side to look at this problem. Yeah. And I, uh, and you know, and being around guys who, um, don't panic, you know, those, those rare dudes that stay calm, <laughs> Like the fight or flight thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, of the whole crew, I was the one that would panic. <laughs> it's like, you know, run away. And, and, and you know, that was, that was, and they weren't. Uh, so, so I, over the years, some of that rubbed off. And, uh, and I, so again, it always boils down to who's around you and, and, and the positivity and the energy coming off those people. And it radiates and it's diffused and multiplied throughout. Uh, the people that you inter, inter, interact with, if, it, if, it's, if, it's, if it's positively charged, it's going to be a good experience. So does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Mate, absolutely. And, and I think if for some of us, we're, ble we're blessed and very lucky. You know, we, we did win the lottery there and that no matter what, you always manage to see the positive. Don't, no matter how bad the situation is, whether you lose a business, you know, you, you're, you're almost killed, something happens. You just, oh, well, look, it happened. Boom. Time, time to just keep moving forward. Keep, keep leaning into it. There's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do about the bad stuff that happens in life. It just, there really, really isn't, but that's great support network. The people around you um, make, make all, all the difference. There's no doubt, mate, um, that you're now, you're living your purpose, mate. You know, like you're, you're living your, your creative or you're giving an outlet to your creative genius. You're still writing movie on the boil uh, you're reconnected with art. How does it feel every day to, how can you explain it to someone what it feels like? Cause you just take it for granted that this is your life, but what does it feel like when you, you're actually doing the things you want to do every day? It's, it's pure. It's, it's Nirvana. You know, it's, I'm happy. It's, it's, I'm just happy. So you, you, you know, I, I don't leap out of bed in the morning, you know, and then in the morning, woo you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I do, I mean, I do, I, I'm, you have to go through a bit of uh, failure and trauma and, and stuff and, 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 
right right now at this particular moment I, i'm happier now than i've ever been in my life um and it feels great and that's i've got awesome. a hundred that's in the middle of a pandemic and what i'm amazed by sean I know, is how, I know. we've heard that a number of times in this situation you don't need to put a mask on now paulie uh in this in this situation oh, <laughs> automatic <laughs> pandemic oh my gosh uh, that 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 <laughs> <laughs> that you can actually uh you can actually be happy right now <laughs> <laughs> that's a that, no, that's a mask and a half that one so that will keep you. Know, when when we went through the really uh scary bit like <laughs> not that we've gone through a scary bit in perth but at the beginning of of the covid situation um i naturally went into full protection mode <laughs> so you know my wife works in the in the uh, in the high school, not far from from where we live, and so the kids were home from school before the government said you're allowed to do it, and I I, I just went into you know securing the perimeter mode and you know no one gets in or out alive. It was like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to protect the family. <laughs> so the kids were at home. No, that's all good. And Claire's going to work, and I remember I reacted badly and I said, but why? I mean, why? And she looked at me and I said, so you're going to go and wade through this Petri dish of children and they're all carrier monkeys anyway. And you're going to come home <laughs> covered in COVID germs. And I, and I insisted that, you know, I couldn't make her do anything, but I asked her, will you stay home? And she went, nah, okay. And so I insisted on doing the grocery shopping. So once a week I would put on a boiler suit. <laughs> and I'd go to the IGA at, at one o'clock in the morning <laughs> pay, pay a premium for groceries and I'd get there and there wasn't a soul in that store apart from some random dude restocking toilet paper um, and, I, and it occurred to me that I might be overreacting a little bit so I thought just stop for a second and go go you know, go back to the house. And in that, in that scary couple of weeks, Claire would come home from work and I would be waiting in the garage for her. And she'd get out of the car and I'd have a big black plastic box and I'd say, right, strip, everything. <laughs> Handbag, keys, glasses, shoes. Hey, you're the guy we need when the zombie apocalypse hits, that's for sure. Yeah, and she looked at me and she went, oh, and so she washed her hand for 10 minutes and the and thing disinfected, this is in the driveway. And then she got her shoes and her bag and her school thing in another box, which I put in the corner. I said, no, come in the garage and shut the door. I said, strip. And she's, so she's, you know, her, her sensible lady's uniform for, for working at the school. So she's stepping out of her tweed pencil skirt and it's going in the, in the, in the, in the bucket. And I said, everything. She kind of looked at me. I was doing my best serious face. So she stepped out of everything. And then I produced some red heels and said, now put these on. <laughs> And she went, she kicked the shit out of me. It was funny. Oh, God. <laughs> so I stopped oh, taking Paul, look, On that note, mate, we'll, we'll wrap up podcast. That's a perfect one. note to finish. <laughs> and we'll pick up, we'll pick up another, uh, another podcast with you, mate, in a, in a few months. Paulie, awesome, mate. It was so cool. Always, always fun to reconnect with you. Always hard to put the phone down. When I was in isolation, you know, one of the first people that gave me a phone call uh, was Paulie, so I appreciate that friendship, mate, and uh, and, and reaching out uh, there. And, and it's just such a pleasure to have a chat with you, mate, and see you uh, happy and, and living the life you want to lead. And that wraps up another episode of The Few. Thank you to our partners, Afterburner, for team building, development, and alignment. We understand now how important it is to have the right people around you. Get them on board with where you want to go. Momentum Media the largest industry publisher in the country, connecting your business to the Australian community. ICMI, Australia's premier speaker bureau, representing the few that do fulfill their life's purpose. And finally, Sean's Inner Circle, the business coaching organization for small and medium enterprises looking to make that next step. Thanks again for listening in and downloading today. Please leave a review on whatever platform you are currently listening to this podcast and reach out to our partners who can help you Make the transition to the few. And thanks for coming in, Paul. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much.